welcome. We're grateful to have you with us here on this first Sunday in June of Pride Month. So a couple of things I want to call to your attention before we uh, get too deep into the service is that we are going to be celebrating communion uh, later in the service. So if you do not have your communion elements, uh, we invite you to take the time now to get them or during our opening song. You can find any uh, bread or cracker or any liquid. And we believe that once those items are consecrated, they symbolically become the body and the blood of Christ. And so we don't need to be uh, worshiping in a physical space for it to be consecrated. You can do that from the very comforts of your home. Again, we're so honored that you have chosen to worship with us at MCC Detroit. I invite you now to bow your hearts in a word of opening prayer. Gracious Creator, many of us have had an incredibly challenging week as we have seen uh, things unfold via the news, and we recognize our hearts just go out and are heavy for all that is happening. Many of us have been so cooped up in our homes due to the coronavirus, and yet here we find ourselves on this first Sunday of June, which is titled Pride Month. I pray that we would go back to the very beginning of our own pride, the times in which we first loved ourselves and accepted ourselves in our fullness. No matter how we identify, self-acceptance, is a must. It is a, it's vital for our own survival. So God, I say thank you for the times in which you have called us out of our darkness into your marvelous light. And may we continue to reside there. May we live there as we continue to bless you and bless others as a result. In your blessed name, we pray this day. Amen. <laughs> verses 16 through 20 from the NIV. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. And surely, I am with you to the very end of the age. The Word of God for the people of God. We're starting a brand new series entitled Pride Outside the Box. 
And again, it's difficult to try to have pride and to celebrate when you have witnessed all that has happened over this past week. But <clears throat> rather than just simply get into a place of focusing on the, the destruction or even the death, there have been some wonderful things that have happened as a, as a result of the protests that have come about. We've had 13 sustained days of protests, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And they've been outraged by the filming, filmed murder of George Floyd. And those protests are infused with hope and with energy. Chokeholds are now banned as a form of control in Minneapolis. Black Lives Matter message now extends for three blocks leading into Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C. And it is on the now newly named Black Lives Matters Boulevard. Retired military leaders with influential voice and power telling the president just to resign. Ohio, the state of Ohio, passed a resolution calling racism a public health crisis and adding money to get things done. Police officers caught on tape assaulting and killing citizens, being fired and charged with murder or manslaughter. And coalitions of people led by young people creating change in communities, in states and all over the world. Truly power to the people. And when it comes to having change and how change even comes about, that happens when people get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When they lose their fear and they begin to stand up and to speak out for truth. So imagine that if we didn't have coronavirus, many of us would be out right now, quite possibly eating too much and drinking too much at a pride celebration. Some of us getting sunburned. But that's not the reality of where we are for Pride Month of 2020. And imagine if all of this social unrest, as it is called, imagine if that happened a year ago, or if this year was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall protests and the riots. I imagine there would be more solidarity with the black and brown trans women who started the protest which led into days of, 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 of conflict because they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. So here we are, Pride Month 2020. And how then do we encapsulate all that's happening? And how do we make sense of it all to continue to have our pride not squashed and not to be diminished in our lives? I invite you now to bow your heads one more time for a word of prayer. Thank you, gracious God, for this day that we find ourselves in. And we pray that through the darkness of death and, and challenge and disease that has happened, that we are able to find your marvelous light. We love you and say thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Pride always comes from protest. Pride always comes from protest. And if you don't believe me, think about next month, we're gonna be celebrating the 4th of July, eating too much, drinking too much, and celebrating the liberation of the colonies from England during the American Revolution that the, what, the, what, came, what came together for that revolution 
was basically a protest, a protest around being squashed, your voice being controlled, your very lives being diminished. And so when you protest, protest is also very personal. Again, when you've had enough and you get mad as hell that you're not gonna take it anymore, you demand change. And yet, unlike the American Revolution that was long fought and it came to an end and it resulted in the formation of these United States. But the struggle for women, people of color, LGBT people, th their fight for recognition and dignity continues. So in other words, you don't have to be a woman in order to be a feminist. You don't have to be a Black person to appreciate and celebrate Black History Month. You don't have to identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender in order to celebrate Pride Month. All you need is to have is a common humanity with the struggles that other people face. And that's why when people either seriously or snarkily say, well, why don't we have, why don't we celebrate Men's Month or White History or Straight People's Month? or even Blue Lives Matter. That can cause hurt for so many people who are still in the struggle and it belittles the, the current struggle these groups face on a daily basis. This past week I have heard from many of you and many of my great friends literally all over the world through uh, MCC wanting to check in on me and seeing how am I doing? How am I feeling? Because again, when we see all that's happening and recognizing that I, as a black man in America, that easily could have been me. It could have been Roland Stringfellow rather than a George Floyd. So I understand and I appreciate people outreaching. I was talking to my brother this past week and he said he's been finding the same things, his friends calling and checking on him. How are you doing? How are you feeling? And he said to them in response, it's like, well, I feel the same way you feel. I'm sure when you look at human suffering, you feel sick to your stomach and you feel like you want to do something. So in that sense, I'm sure you know how I feel because we experience the same horror, correct? And we recognize that often, sometimes we don't see the world like everyone else does or other people don't see the same events the same way we do. When you, I was actually horrified to see that of the four officers who were arrested this past week, two were men of color. And you kind of wonder like, wow, like how did that happen? Well, it happens when something really doesn't become personal for you and you become disconnected from our common humanity. When you start thinking more about yourself or more, more about people who are just like you, whether they're in your same family, in your same racial group or same affiliation, then again, you become cut off and everyone else becomes the other. When that happens, then you may not have the same type of emotion when you see 
a human suffering, the human suffering that we all have seen on the news. Generally, when we see a dog hit by a car, there, that does something to us and we have a visceral reaction and it's like, oh my gosh, this living creature has just died. But then you wonder that how can you take the life of a human being and be so casual and callous that you put your hands in your pocket? Or you assist someone who's cutting off the airway to this person for eight minutes until that person dies. There's only one way that happens. That happens when it doesn't become personal and you are disconnected from humanity. As I mentioned, pride always comes from protest. And protest is always personal. The song that we began with, Singing for Our Lives, that's an oldie but a goodie. And many of you who are on today's worship service know the author of that song, Holly Near. Either you know her personally or you are familiar with her work because she is a out lesbian civil rights person who has done some great work throughout her lifetime. She's still living. And one of the things that Holly's song does, it's she, as she wrote that song, Singing for Our Lives, it's a very personal song that came out of a protest and it led to pride. And we sing the verses that are most common, but the song continues with lyrics that reflect her personal struggle and the personal struggle of many. And I would like to share my screen once again and uh, so you can see that. We are a land of many colors and we are singing singing for our lives. We are gay and straight together. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, loving people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. These words come from, from a personal place of struggle. And I'm sure these particular words that oftentimes don't get included in the, in the song make some too uncomfortable. Because they'll look at this and say, oh, no, 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 that's too radical. To talk about racial equity and equality for LGBT people, that's too radical of a concept for us to sing about, especially in a church. But radical is not a bad word. And I said this a couple of weeks ago, that nothing ever great has been accomplished that wasn't considered radical, or it didn't, didn't come from a radical action. And so Holly Nair, again, many of you know her from the uh, Michigan Women's Music Festival. But you may not know that she began her career as an actress. And she had some bit parts and some television shows. But then she also was in the Broadway musical Hair back in 1970. Later that year in 1970, that is when the Kent State shootings occurred. And she joined a musical troupe called FTA, or Free the Army. And it was from the FTA group that, uh, uh, where she was introduced to people like Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland, the actor. 
and they spoke up and they spoke out from a very personal place that the events at, at Kent State and, and, and really the wars that were happening, they've recognized they needed to use their power and their influence to make the conditions for others better. It was during this time, this era, where Holly Near came out of the closet as a lesbian and she became a feminist and an anti-war activist. And the song, Singing for Our Lives, she wrote that this was a cry because she wrote this song in response to the shooting and the murder of Counselor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone in San Francisco in the year 1978. That this became her way of protest, using her gift, using her art of music and songwriting to put emotions to music. And since that time, Many movements have borrowed this song, Singing for Our Lives, to express how they felt. When 49 people were killed in Orlando in June at the nightclub, this song was sung. There have been demonstrations all over the world, and such as in Palestine, that that the Palestinians recognize that this is a song that they can cling to that speaks about their struggle, what they were personally going through, because they were singing for their lives. There's another individual who I want to call your attention to, and that is also another activist and I, I, I love Audrey Lord. She's a self-described black lesbian mother, warrior, poet, feminist, womanist, and civil rights activist. And many of us may be familiar with this particular quote. I want to read this. Tell them about how you never really were a whole person if you remain silent because there's always that one little piece inside of you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak to it, excuse me, if you don't speak it out, one day it will just up and punch you in the mouth from the inside. This encapsulates, I believe, what many people feel when it comes to when they've had enough and they have to stand up and they have to speak out. They can be silent no longer. Our dear Lord put those feelings to poetry. And many of a freedom fighter, many of a civil rights activist have borrowed her words to express exactly how they're thinking and how they're feeling and use her words as motivation to create change. For those who are unfamiliar with Audre Lorde, her formation as a black lesbian warrior, as she calls it, began in high school when she participated in the Harlem Writers Guild. It was there that she learned how to write and how to express herself. But it was even then, during those early days, she simply couldn't hide who she was. She felt that she was not accepted because she was considered both crazy and queer. It was then later in life that as she became um, a more proficient writer that she uh, went to Cuba and was invited to be on a Black women's writers group there. And it was there that she embraced her own sexuality and she had solidarity with the gays and lesbians who were there. 
and she wrote one of her more famous books called Black Unicorn that describes the mythos of the African female deities in terms of creation and fertility and their warrior-ness and strength. So during this trip to connect with other people in their struggles, she found her voice. She found her identity. Many of you also be, may be familiar with her words from her two most well-known writings, the first is called The Cancer Journals, and the second is Sister Outsider, where she explores her uh, diagnosis and her illness and her disability, her treatment for cancer, as well as the topic of sexuality and what is actual physical beauty, that it comes from the inside, from that self-acceptance. It's in her book, Sister Outsider, where she wrote these words. Those of us who stand on the outside of the circle of this society's definition of what it means to be an acceptable woman, those of us who have been forged in the crucible of difference, those of us who are poor, those of us who are lesbian, those of us who are Black, those of us who are older know what it means to be a survivor. And that is not simply an academic skill. It's learning how to take our differences and to make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. That last line is so important, I'm gonna read it again. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. We wonder how and why these men of color could participate and allow someone else to take the life of George Floyd. We wonder how some people can seem so callous to human suffering that they stand by and they remain silent or still worse, participate in the oppression of others. This happens, according to Audre Lorde, when we take a look at the master's tools and the master's house, and we feel that there's no other way that I can survive. In other words, I have to depend upon something else or someone else for my own survival. Those are the individuals who have not found their own voice. Those are the individuals who still act out of fear and true isolation from their own heart and from our common humanity. Audre Lorde's words, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, but never knew what it quite meant. Here's another way of saying that. It means that when the tools used in racism, such as intimidation, violence, exclusion. If those tools are used to try to end racism, that's foolish. You can't use intimidation and violence and exclusion to end racism. Another example is trying to end corporate greed 
by participating in consumer, consumerism and globalization. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I want to end with a question for you. When did you decide enough is enough and began to speak your own truth? Hopefully, you've had that time. Hopefully, you've had that experience where you, and no matter how you identify, no matter who you are, where you were raised, what your experience has actually been, that you were at a place where you recognized that I am being oppressed by remaining silent and not speaking my own truth. I don't have that personal freedom. And so speaking out is going to cost me something but I'm willing to pay that price. I'm willing to stand up for myself, even if no one else is going to stand up with me. And I will have the confidence and the courage to stand beside someone else in solidarity when they don't have the strength to stand up for themselves. Or in the case of George Floyd, when someone's life is eradicated. That you're going to stand up, you're going to speak out, you're going to march, and you're going to let the world know that you're mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore. So what about you? When did you decide enough was enough and decided to speak your truth? the truth for yourself and the truth on behalf of others. I'm going to end with this. MCC Detroit, we are in the middle of a strategic planning process. And we are trying to figure out the best way we can be a radically inclusive church where all people feel valued and welcome. We recognize that when it comes to identifying and recognizing uh, people who are transgender, that we have a lot of work to do at MCC Detroit to make sure we're not misgendering people, that we're not calling them a gender that is not theirs, that we're being cognizant enough to, and, and courteous enough to ask someone, what are your pronouns? Because you matter to me. So that's one thing. But I think that we as MCC Detroit and the entire globe, we are in a movement moment that if we do not address the sin of racism, we're never going to do it. Not in our lifetime. MCC Detroit is posed perfectly to be this radically inclusive church where all people are welcome because we live in Southeast Michigan. With the history of racial prejudice, bigot bigotry, and isolation, we can be an answer to what people are looking for. But we won't do that if we don't examine ourselves and start looking and seriously seen how we can be an anti-racist organization. That truly, when we say all are welcome, no matter what your skin is, no matter what your ethnicity is, and this is greater than just simply black or white, 
but all people that we are going to be a people doing the hard work of self-introspection. This is our time, and this is our moment as a ministry to get it right. Will we fail? Will we mess up? Will we offend people? We will. But we at least not, we, we, we at least have to move forward not in, and, and be held back because of fear of offending somebody. We have to do this in a way that is going to be productive. And there are many congregations and organizations that are doing that. And my hope and my prayer as pastor of this congregation is that we engage in that. As I said, earlier, that when it comes to this whole concept of pride, pride always comes from protest. And protest is always personal. This has to be personal for each and every one of us to make sure that when we do public ministry, we're not hurting other people in the process. That is a way we can have pride outside the box. And I hope that you will continue to join us because as we have, as we're going to be doing for the rest of the month, we're going to be inviting other voices to help us think how we can be the very best we can. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the time in our service where we share prayers of the people. At MCC Detroit, we believe in the power of prayer. Our prayers together are more important than ever during this difficult time. If you would like to have a prayer added to our church prayer list, please visit our website, mccdetroit.org. We publish the prayer list each Wednesday in our online newsletter. Please read it and lift the people up that are listed in prayer during the week. Now, let us go to God together in prayer. God of justice, we seek you today as we struggle to become a world where all people, regardless of color, are valued equally, where tolerance and injustice have no place. Guide us to understand how we may personally and collectively work to heal our community and our country. May our eyes and hearts be open to ways we contribute to the problem, and may we take personal responsibility for the hurt we cause. Help us to listen, to love, and respect those who are different from us, and, who, and to actively seek justice for all. Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate Pride Month. We are grateful for those who marched for us at Stonewall. And we request your blessing and guidance as we continue to fight for acceptance and equal rights. Help us to appreciate and celebrate the rainbow people we are. Merciful God, we continue to ask your direction as this pandemic drags on. We grieve the toll this continues to take in our world. Let us renew our commitment to keep ourselves safe and protect others. Once again, we praise you and ask for your protection and the protection for all who are working to feed us, protect us, heal us, lead us, and comfort us during this pandemic. Holy One, we thank you for your church and ask for your guidance for us in figuring out how to be your best servants in this challenging time. Guide our pastors and leaders and bless them in their work for us. Help guide them as they make decisions for our church as our communities begin to transition from stay at home to interacting with care. Great Physician, we ask for your help for those in need of comfort, healing, or peace. For those who are in need of work or financial support, we request your intervention for them as well. Now, we lift to you the silent petitions on our hearts.
Thank you, God, for listening to our prayers. And thank you in advance for the ways that you care for us through your awesome power and love. Amen. Please join me now in reciting the Creator's Prayer. Our Creator, who we are a part of, hallowed be your name. Your dominion come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the dominion, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We at MCC Detroit and at MCCs across the world believe in an open communion table. What that means for you is that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church in order to receive the gifts God has given to us. Now, there may be some things that happened during this week or the last week that you have pulled away from God, that you have pulled yourself away. All I would ask you to do now is that you would go to the God of your understanding and confess those things. And it is with blessed assurance that I assure you that God takes those things, throws them deep into the ocean, and never thinks of them again. On the night that Jesus was portrayed in an upper room with his friends, he took bread, he raised it, gave thanks for it, blessed it, and broke it. He gave it to each one of his friends and he said, take this and eat of it. This is my body, broken for each one of you willingly. All I ask is that when you do this, remember me. And when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and praise. He blessed it and passed it to his disciples and said, take this and drink, drink deeply from this cup, for this is a cup of my love, my blood, poured out for each and every one of you. It is a new covenant, a new promise. It will never be broken. And all I ask is that when you do this, you remember me. And now you may consume the elements. Gracious Creator, we thank you for these elements. We thank you that they will be the lifeblood for each one of us to go about and do your good works throughout the next week. In Christ's many names we pray. Amen. We're grateful that you are continuing to keep up with your giving during this time that we are apart. And we invite you to um, send in your gifts, your contributions to our ministry either electronically or you can mail in your check to our P.O. Box address. You can find instructions on how to do both on our website at mccdetroit.org. And again, we're so very grateful for all that you do to help partner with us in ministry. So God, I say thank you for our partners in ministry. Would you continue to bless them, give them a blessing as they continue to bless other people. In your blessed name, amen. We are now at the end of our time and we have some announcements we want to go through. We have started our preaching series, Pride Outside the Box, as I mentioned during my message. And I am very excited to have um, voices from all over the United States and the globe to give us messages um, beginning this month and spilling into the month of July and you see their names here and where they are located uh, uh, in, in terms of the MCCs. And so again, we are grateful to partner with them as well as they bless us with our um, preaching series. Uh, we also have um, celebrating our Pride Month on each Saturday. And last evening, we had a great time at our virtual film night hosted by uh, Deacons Roland Smith and Paul Matson, And we're looking forward to coming up this Saturday, the 13th, where we're going to partner with the Ruth Ellis Center on the Ruth Ellis Legacy Program. 
talking about Ruth Ellis, watching the film Ruth Ellis at 100, and hearing about the past, present, and future of connecting with people in their struggles. So again, we hope that you will join us. You can uh, go to our Facebook page and our website to get the link in order to join. We have the Drop the Brush Challenge. We're gonna have um, individuals to show off their original fashions and their, uh, their and I would, I'm gonna call it their pandemic wear. We have um, masks that are very um, uh, be bejeweled and bedazzled with the MCC logo on them and other people will be sharing those. It is gonna be a, a, a wonderful experience and you don't wanna miss that. So also check our webpage and our Facebook, uh, how to connect there. But the thing that I'm very excited about is this talent, no talent contest. And we're inviting folks to send in videos of themselves, either serious or comical. And then the first place winner will receive $100. The second place winner will be uh, receive 50. And the uh, third place will be 25. Again, you can go to our website to find out the rules and how to upload your video there. We're also looking for those of you who are wanting to participate in our digital worship ministry. If, uh, if you attended our congregational meeting last week, we talked about that we will have in-person worship again. But in the meantime, we really do need to develop and have a more robust digital worship experience. And so we're looking for volunteers who can help join us. And if you are interested, you can just contact us at the church, um, mccdetroit at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to connect with you. for us and you have invited us to step up and to step out and to begin to speak our truth. Help us to be our own best advocate and to always stand in solidarity whenever anyone is being oppressed or forgotten. God, I thank you for the protests that have happened and we recognize that those who want to take advantage of the situation by looting or creating other forms of violence, that they are disconnected. And so God, we pray for them as well, that they would also find and discover their truth and not to solely think about what's in it for me, but to always care for their sisters and their brothers. Thank you again for this day. And as always, continue to help us as we go out to change this world as you, as cha as you have changed our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>